Hello, everyone. I'm Ben Johnson, and this is the Perpetual Chess Podcast. On Perpetual Chess, I have weekly conversations with the chess world's best players, promoters, and educators about their lives, careers, current projects, and best practices. Perpetual Chess is brought to you through the generosity of its Patreon and PayPal supporters. For more information, go to perpetualchesspod.com. Hey everyone, welcome back to Perpetual Chess. First off, I want to apologize for the slightly late release this week. We had some super frustrating tech issues last week where I tried to interview our guest and uh, she was quite compelling and had some interesting things to say, Uh, but my microphone kept echoing in my ear and it turned out on the recording. So uh, we we tried to will it to go away, but it didn't go away. So eventually we had to reschedule. So that's why we're late. I apologize for that, but everything sounds good right now. And I already got a sneak preview of this guest. So we had chatted for about 20 minutes that won't be released due to the sound quality. But we will try to keep this conversation organic and then get to the meat of the conversation. And of course, the conversation this week is an adult improvement conversation. So for those who haven't heard these uh, types of interviews before, they are a series here on Perpetual Chess where instead of... uh, um, where we focus more on uh, adults who have achieved a lot in, in in growing their chess rating and getting better at chess, um, even sometimes while holding down jobs or going to school or whatever it may be. And as I said, we have a great guest this week. She is a 25-year-old software engineer from Chicago, Illinois. And from uh, trough to peak, her rating gained about 1,000 points from about 900 to 1,900 uh, over a span of less than five years. So very impressive progress. Those are USCF ratings for anyone wondering. Um, She's had uh, a bit of a dip since then, which of course we will talk about and we all know is a normal part of chess improvement. Uh, does not diminish the feat at all, and I'm sure she, her high rating has not been attained, has not yet been attained. But in any event, with without any more blabbering from me, let's uh, introduce our guest, Megan Chen. Thanks for joining us, Megan. Yeah, thank you, Ben. And thanks again for for your patience with these tech issues. I've been on a good run of that stuff not happening. It's it's extremely frustrating when it does, but everything sounds crystal clear right now. So we're gonna have to, as we were talking before we recorded. Um, just go into your background a little bit. So I believe you just played a tournament this weekend since I talked to you last. So we'll get to that in a minute. But why don't you briefly uh, tell our listeners how you rediscovered chess in college? Sure. So I first uh, rediscovered my uh, interest for chess, uh, mainly through uh, National Master Balin Lee, who was uh, one of my close friends in college. And uh, he was all, he would always be playing tournaments every single weekend. And basically the gist of it was that uh, because of how much I was hanging around him and hearing his stories about it, uh, I was basically just feeling inspired, thinking, oh, I used to play quite a bit when I was a uh, scholastic beginner player. But um, why not uh, just feel like wanting to um, bask in the fun um, due to uh, the influence of a good friend? Yeah, and I know that Carnegie Mellon had some other strong players as well, Grant Zhu, and I can't remember who else. But I know that, as we talked about briefly last week, I lived in Pittsburgh at that time, and they always fielded teams in the Pittsburgh Chess League, and you would see people around the tournament. So definitely a, a good place to be if you're trying to get back into chess. Oh yeah, definitely. They they also have quite a number of uh, strong players in their um in, in their um internal chess club, which I've only been to like I think um, two meetings, mostly due to like uh, my in, uh, my interest level being only like very very casual and my time with uh, being a double major in math and computer science and therefore having a lot of work. Uh, and uh, they also always had a reputation of fielding a very strong team every year for the World Amateur Team or U.S. Amateur Team East tournaments which is also pretty prestigious. Yes, uh, math and computer yeah. science at Carnegie Mellon. That's no joke, Megan. Yeah. Um, so once you get back into chess, uh, what's next, Megan? Um, so uh, once, uh, once, I got, uh, once I got back in, um, that was via through playing a uh, unrated tournament in Monroeville, which was a three-round quad tournament and having won first place with a perfect score there. 
although um, the strength of the field was fairly um, novice from, like, players who haven't played a tournament before, I was just thinking, like, well, I didn't get, like, totally, totally rusty that I just forgot everything that I learned when I was a kid. And so um, I decided to get back into it when um, I realized how much more free time that I had uh, after um, uh, after uh, being done with all the heavy homework load from college. And so then I decided uh, that... Initially, when it came to coming back to USCF rated tournament chess, I had a lot of uh, weekend free time when I was uh, working my uh, software engineering summer 2015 internship at Microsoft that I decided to check out the St. Louis Chess Club. Again, back then, I was fairly casual and uh, just decided to um, play, I think, two tournaments um, just for just for funsies, nothing really serious. Uh, and, then, um, after, uh, and then after that... Uh, Eventually, when I um, got my first uh, full-time job out of school and uh, moved to down, uh, moved to Chicago, I decided, again, well, there's this whole void of free time. What sort of activity do I want to um, pursue as a primary passion outside of uh, doing my re- doing my day-to-day career work as a software engineer? And uh, I decided, well, um, because I uh, had some semi-decent interest in chess. I didn't want to just like totally give it up because I also remembered uh, when I was a kid, people told me that I had a lot of talent and um, were kind of surprised that I just like sort of dropped off the scene when I was in seventh grade. Uh, I decided to um, get back back into it. And um, I definitely uh, am glad that I chose to. That's interesting that that was the time that you chose to drop out because as as I've talked about with some other guests and woman guests in particular, it seems like that's a sort of um that's a common time where girls either kind of step up their interest level or they sometimes quit entirely. So yeah, I agree. Um, I think it's mainly because like I don't know if that's the case just for girls, but I do believe that um, especially around like late middle school, a lot of people in general do start realizing what their true interests are. And um, I also personally have uh, had friends who were in the same who were or are in the same boat where like at, at, at middle school age, they realize, well, they've already had the chance to try, try out a lot of activities. And so they decide is one thing like their thing or not really. Yeah, that makes sense. Especially I'm guessing you were a pretty, um, pretty motivated student being that you ended up at Carnegie Mellon with the double majors you mentioned. So uh, whatever your hobby is going to be, it seems like you were the kind of kid that would take it seriously. Oh, Yeah. <laughs> Uh, and still did once you got back into it as an adult. So once you did get back into it, Megan, um, and you're just starting to play as a working professional, what what were your first steps to try to get better? So um, the first thing that uh, I remember doing when I was uh, getting back into uh, playing serious tournament chess and wanting to improve more seriously as an adult player rather than just a uh, very casual scholastic player. I uh, d- uh, one night um, when I realized that I just wanted to figure out what I wanted to do with all the um, abundant free time that I had after work on weekday evenings. Um, I happened to browse around the internet looking for chess clubs and chess meetups and discovered the um, West Loop Chicago uh, a chess club held at an Irish pub at um, in in the West loop of Chicago. Um, they meet, uh, they meet on Monday nights, um, at like seven o'clock for a few hours. And so I decided, well, um, let's go check it out. And, uh, it turned out that it was a great experience for me because I got a chance to face a lot of, uh, strong adult players, most of whom were at that time much higher rated than me. Um, probably about like, say 600 to 700 USCF rating points. And so I found that it was uh, a very productive experience being able to play and learn from stronger players. And um, they were even very uh, cordial enough to offer me free analysis after the game. So that was, I thought, a very perfect way to be able to improve and also to um, get a better glimpse of like what more um, serious adult club tournament chess uh, looked like in terms of like the playing strength level and the general atmosphere of it. And it definitely was a very um, interesting experience too, from what I uh, used to see when I was a uh, schola- younger scholastic player back in seventh grade, playing mostly like under 1200 or like under 1000 or under 800 tournaments. So were you notating these games, Megan? 
Um, no, I did not because uh, they were casual games, and secondly, because uh, I played them at a uh, faster time control. Most of those games would be like game ten or game fifteen, um, but with the stronger players being very experienced with like remembering moves or remembering like general ideas of what happened, it was not too hard to um, recreate some positions from the games. Okay. And then once you get more sort of formal in your study, Megan, besides uh, having the benefit, as you mentioned, which is not to be downplayed of, of having stronger players look at the games with you, uh, what, what did you do in terms of a regimented study once, it, once that became um, something you committed to? Uh, so eventually what I did was uh, after I started playing some more tournaments and realizing uh, how much I had to uh, relearn slash uh, catch up from being rusty from my uh, scholastic days, um, I decided that in order to really get a chance to reflect and look back at my mistakes and try to learn from them, I um, I, I decided to um, start a uh, chess.com blog of uh, tournament games where I would um, post the games and um, write notes in them and post them on Facebook to, for um, stronger Chicago area players to give feedback or any other players who are in my close friend circles. And so um, from that, I received quite an overwhelming amount of feedback, and I even got some um, applause and uh, some nice compliments from people saying that they liked the amount of dedication that I had with um, reflecting back on my game mistakes and um, writing my own comments on them and uh, being very thorough and in-depth with my analysis. That um, that also earned me my first chess coach, Ryan Murphy. And um, he actually, uh, he and I actually started working together, not in the traditional way of student approaches coach. It was actually the other way around. He approached me because he um, saw my posts via uh, the Facebook Chicago area chess group, liked them, and was interested in helping me out. Awesome. Uh, so once you have a coach in place, Megan, uh, what sort of approach, and, I, and we'll get to your, your other coach uh, in a minute, but what sort of approach did Ryan Murphy take with you once once you guys uh, struck up a working relationship? Yeah, so uh, when Ryan and I first uh, started working together, uh, what he initially did during the first couple lessons was um, he got a chance to take a look at my um, recent tournament games from um, the past weekend or a couple weekends worth of tournaments and would get uh, an initial sense of like what my uh, pri- uh, what my um, key strengths and weaknesses were at that time and um, then basically uh, use that to kind of like determine like what level of puzzles that he would give and uh, back when we first initially started working together his lesson stru- structure would usually consist of um, doing roughly like four to five um warm-up tactics puzzles that usually he picked out from um, chess.com tactics trainer or um, some other uh, various tactics books that he owns and uh, uses to, uh, uses at, for puzzles that he gives to his students. And then um, we would go over um, either tournament games, if I recently played uh, games, or we would go over um, other positions that he would give, usually mainly focused on tactics and calculation back oh. at the um, roughly 1,000 rating level. Okay, so sounds fairly standard for a coach-student relationship. Aside from the chess.com tactics trainer puzzles that he picked out, do you remember any of the resources, just in case there are any um, uh, players around that level looking for tactics uh, recommendations? Oh, yes. So um, one of the things that I think also was uh, the biggest uh, key- key factor in me improving my calculation skills was uh, he decided to um, assign me to work on roughly like six tactics per um, prior to each lesson from this ridiculously huge tactics book that's called Combinational Motifs Mm -hmm. by um, Maxime Bloch. And that is a colossal tactics book that features um, problems from like literally every um, tactical pattern or mo- motif that you can find on a chessboard. And those puzzles range um, anywhere from like beginner level one to like um, almost super hard, impossible difficulty or almost impossible difficulty unless you really, really um, spend some hours calculating on it, um, level 20 puzzles. And um, there were a total of like 1,200 plus puzzles in that book. And I am happy to say that ever since 
um, around like early summer 2016 when he uh, started me on that book. Um, I am happy to report that I recently just finished all 1200 plus puzzles of that book um, just a couple of days ago um, at the beginning of the month. Congratulations. Yeah, thanks. It was um, quite a marathon, but um, I felt that all the time spent was certainly worth it. Um, good. And I'm just going to pause for a second to say, listeners, I know my, my mic is echoing a tiny bit. This is what was happening last week, and it was worse. But Megan, we're just going to power through because right now it's not that bad. And I think it's going to stay at this level. I don't expect it to get worse. But anyway, I apologize for, for the inconvenience listeners. But Megan is, um, you know, she's doing the heavy lifting here, not me. And I think um, we, we just need to keep going. Um, so with that out of the way, I did just want to say I remember because I did uh, combination art. Um, I uh, Kamaniska Iskusva, I believe it was called in Russian, just an absolute classic from Soviet era chess in terms of tactics. But I didn't remember that the puzzles went down that low. I feel like I found that book when I was like 15 or 1600. Uh, so you weren't just totally overwhelmed when you started tackling that book? Uh, some of those puzzles were actually doable for like roughly 1200 USCF. When I, uh, when I started working on that book, I think I was roughly about, um, low to mid 1200 USCF back in, um, summer, early summer, 2016. Okay. So yeah, that is, that is a book that will keep you busy for a long time. And I definitely echo, echo the recommendations. Uh, as I mentioned to Megan last week, um, I think it's, I think there's a few errors, of course, because it's a, you know, 40 year old book. Uh, so it didn't have, um, you know, it didn't have crafty and stockfish blunder checking it. But overall, it's still well worth your time. Um, uh, definitely a, a good, um, a good tactics book to try out. So uh, that brings us to your other coach, Megan. So you're working with Ryan and it sounds like he's a good coach and helping you a lot. Um, but you also, and, and I had known this going in just because I found a little write up about you, um, on like a, a Chicago area, um, chess blog. So that you had mentioned that Nazi Pekidzi also, um, eventually became one of your coaches. Yep. She started working, uh, working with me back in spring 2017. And that was when I was, um, around low to mid 1500s. Okay. And for listeners, most listeners probably know, but Nazi Pekidzi has been us women's champion. Uh, very nice woman who was the third guest on Perpetual Chess. So if you haven't gone through the whole archive, you can hear a lot about her background um, from about two years ago. Um, so I'm going to read you. Um, so, Megan, we have, as you know, a handful of questions from supporters of the podcast. So thanks for the great questions, everyone. For anyone who hasn't heard how this works, basically people who donate a small amount of money to help support the podcast, find out the guests in advance and are able to send in questions. And my first question is from longtime listener and friend of the podcast, Peter Newhall. Uh, and Peter asks, he says, I'm starting to be most curious about the coaches of adult improvers and what kind of assistance they provide. I've tried several online coaches and one that while they all seem to focus on going over games I've played, many provide no notes. Uh, some do. Others have homework. Others, not from my personal experience, have a curriculum. So the question would be, it seems you have two coaches, Nazi Pekidzi and Ryan Murphy. How is your work and lessons with them structured? Do, do they hold you accountable for homework? Or are you left on your own to select training materials for improvement? So, of course, you've already talked about uh, how Ryan structures things a little bit. So maybe you could focus more on Nazi and then uh, get to the part about uh, how they hold you accountable. Yeah, so um, occasionally, uh, not not after uh, not after every single lesson, but after um, some lessons from time to time, whenever she finds interesting contents, she would assign me um, homework positions related to either calculation or mill game plans to work on um, prior to the next lesson, and um, it the uh, and uh, they definitely uh, come out to be very interesting puzzles because uh, because they force me to really think outside the box with regards to um, middle game planning and also um, calculation. And um, as far as like uh, lesson structure, um, she mostly focuses uh, on uh, she mostly focuses her um, lessons on um, one of uh, the following focus areas. There's um, calculation. There's also positional thinking. There's also um, end games. And um, there's also um, I guess uh, I would uh, I, I would call it um, I guess uh, well yeah. There, there's basically calculate uh, uh, middle uh, middle game deep calculation. 
end games and as well as um, positional planning. So she would usually pick one of those three areas to focus on for um, the majority of positions that she gives during the lesson and uh, basically tailor the chosen um, problems from it, uh, uh, tailor the chosen problems that are relevant to the um, given focus area uh, during the lesson. Um, occasionally she would, uh, she would definitely like rotate them from time to time when it comes to uh, doing um, problems together and working through positions together. And um, it usually, uh, and she usually picks them out based on um, what uh, she feels uh, would be most relevant and appropriate to work on based on recent term and game performance and mistakes and uh, stuff like that, or whatever else she finds interesting from um, recent uh, top grandmaster tournament games as well. And uh, of course, after um, tournaments, we would definitely spend time reviewing my recent games and uh, talking about mistakes that I made uh, in terms of uh, calculation or middle game and end game plans. And uh, definitely we also spend some time either in the beginning or the end um, where we address my questions related to any openings that I've worked on or um ask her or whenever I ask her any suggestions for um, opening variations to play or um, decisions on whether to um, change from one opening to another. Okay. And you were, you were working with both coaches concurrently once you started working with Nazi as well. Yeah. um, I, you, on a typical week um, I would work with Ryan um, about like once or twice per week for roughly about like one and a half to two hours per lesson. And uh, for Nazi uh, one lesson per week for an hour. Okay, and you would look at the same game with each of them if if circumstances warranted. Uh, yeah, and uh, it's interesting to get uh, two um, independent perspectives from two very strong players too, because um, sometimes they may have uh, different perspectives, but overall uh, they definitely um, mean very well in terms of uh, the feedback that they give, and uh, overall, um, uh, overall it really shows in their feedback that they are very caring and very very meaningful in terms of. Uh, in terms of like um, the tips that they give as far as like uh, reacting to mistakes and stuff. Can you think of any specific examples, Megan, of uh, like holes in your game that one of your coaches helped plug? Um, yeah. So uh, one of the things that I have really been trying to um, work on lately is time management. Um, both of my coaches have pointed out that um, they think in quite a big number of my games, I'm often able to um, either outplay or get really strong positions, even against um, higher rated opponents, but um, sometimes don't always convert them due to to getting low on time relative to them on the clock and therefore um, blundering because of having little time to think. Um, And so uh, what they have uh, definitely um, suggested were two major tips. Um, One of them is known as the um, 20 50 30 rule, which is um, a guide that I like to use when it comes to um, budgeting time in terms of like what percentage of my total clock time I would budget for opening middle game and end game. And um, while that's not always like very uh, easy to predict in um, a game, especially if it um, only spans through um, one time control for the whole game, um, I sometimes also uh, take advantage of uh, of um, situations where there would be uh, two time controls where like you get a certain num- certain amount of time for um, say 30 or 40 moves. Um, and then after you make that number of moves in a certain amount of time, then the time control rolls over to adding an extra um, sudden death amount of time on the clock. And um, with, uh, with, with those situations, I often like to say, like, let's say, for example, I have 40 moves to make in 100 minutes. Then I would like keep a mental note myself saying, by move 20, let's try to make sure that I do not run too far below 50 minutes on the clock so that that way I um, budget enough time for um, uh, forever uh, for whatever has to happen in the first time control of the game. And um, they've also had me um, writing my clock times on my uh, scorebook. So that way, when it comes to talking about critical moments during our game analysis sessions, then um, definitely uh was beneficial for me to be able to report, hey, I spent uh, this amount of time on um, this move because I was considering this variation or that variation and et cetera. 
Wow, that's really good advice and something I've definitely struggled with too, Megan, and I, regular listeners will have heard me discuss it. But one issue that I run into is like I, I set these guidelines and it's kind of like, you you know, any sort of uh, addiction where you say, OK, you know, I'm, I'm not going to have a drink tonight. I'm going to I'm going to not spend an hour in the opening. And, you you know, you come in firm. I would try to tell, tell myself, like, that's my main goal for this tournament. My goal is not to win games. My goal is to play quickly in the opening. And then you sit there and it just feels so important. And I don't know. It, it sounds like maybe you did a better job adjusting than I did because I would set these guidelines. But then I would I would end up I wouldn't usually I wouldn't um just like uh, crudely violate them, but I would bend them. And then it would, sure enough, I would end up in time trouble because it's like if you bend in the opening and you bend in the middle game, then by the time you get to the end game, you're pretty low on time. Um, so especially as I'm like less informed than I used to be when I was younger, I could get in time trouble and get away with it. But anyway, I don't know if, did you find the adjustments hard to make? Um, I found it kind of, I sometimes can find it hard to make when it comes to um, middle game and end game. For some reason, um, I don't totally know why, but um, I have never really had issues with like taking too long to play an opening you because usually um, what I like to do in my routine um, study habit, uh, independent study time is I would like sometimes quiz myself on my openings and just like kind of uh, recite them through my head just to um, remember them better. And then so when it comes to being at the board, I usually end up um, playing openings fairly quickly because either one, I know them really well, or two, I understand that like um, to a certain extent when playing against uh, opponents of a certain level, I don't have to know openings like super 100% crystal clear, like say 20 or 25 moves deep in theory. Sometimes there are situations where I can just get away with like a good move even if it's not necessarily the best move and um, if it gives me like a decent enough position that I play it and I won't be obsessing on like hey did a hundred mass a hundred master games have this move or did only like 50 master games have this move and why 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 and so um, if I get if I have tried out positions or known of positions where um, this move makes sense to me uh then um, even if I don't necessarily remember if it's uh, the correct move in like a very deeply theoretical line, then um, I would not like try to obsess for like over, I don't know, 10 to 15 minutes plus and like, uh, you know, just try to um, focus on playing whatever looks like the most principled move based on um, fundamental opening principles. Yeah, that makes sense. And I guess one thing I should mention, should have mentioned earlier, is you play a ton. So, uh, by the way, I want to thank uh, Chris Wainscott for recommending you as a guest. And one thing he mentioned to me in an email, and I, you know, browsing through your USCF page, which I will will link to in the show description, anyone can confirm this. I mean, you play what, Megan? Twenty five tournaments a year? Um, I would say so, roughly. Right now, uh, I do. Um, in my earlier days, I would usually average about like one or two tournaments per weekend, which is a lot more. But then again, um, that's also because that was back in the days when um, the amount of uh, chess thinking needed per game on average was not as rigorously heavy compared to like how much energy a typical like class A player would spend on each chess game. Because like the more knowledge someone gains, um, I feel like the more... um, mentally draining or mentally busy the brain gets per chess game because the more you know um the more you try to think about and the more sophisticated your um thinking process goes per move per game and then like it adds up faster when you're stronger yeah i mean there's no substitute for playing a lot i think it was john donaldson i mean i asked basically every guest about the best way to improve but he was the one who i think the first thing he said was play a lot and in thinking And in thinking about how you're able to make these adjustments so quickly, and I've uh, struggled with them, I think part of it probably is that you're just you're 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 learning these lessons, you're assimilating them so quickly because it's like you get feedback and then you're back in the ring and and like the situation arises. Whereas for me, it's like even if I get the right feedback, it might be too. I mean, this is even when I was playing, which isn't happening now, but that's another story. Um, it would be two months, three months before the situation arises again. So it just shows the importance and also, of course, the dedication. I mean, it's amazing, Megan, that you're able to do that while working full time. Yeah, for sure. Um, And uh, I think that uh, the thing that really helped me um, 
the thing that uh, that really helped me build that kind of a schedule um, back when I was uh, first starting out with uh, studying Turner Manchester seriously was that I um, I feel that like one of the biggest things that really helps me to uh, fit that in my schedule is um, one having a motivated study plan and because ha- because of having a motivated study plan I know that like I should be fired up and ready for tournaments when the weekend rolls around. And two, um, ever since I picked up tournament chess, um, I cut down very, very, very significantly on um, how much I would drink beer or wine or alcohol. Oh, wow. Very dedicated. So, yeah, I mean, I'm not, I think that one of the, the other things that really has helped me um, uh, improve very quickly is uh, compared to the average, like, pers- uh, human adults in their um, 20s or 30s, I very seldom drink. And um, I think that like it has also contributed overall to my um, general uh, well-being and um, nutrition habits too. You and Shah Mahmoud Yarov, Megan, I don't know if you heard this, but when, you know, he's obviously been an elite player for many years, but he kind of made a leap from top 25 to top 10. And they asked, they said, you're playing so much more consistently. What changed? And he said, he stopped drinking. Yeah. <laughs> well, I used to drink. I did remember I used to drink a lot more when um, uh, before my chest day, uh, uh, before my chest days, sort of not not like, you know, um, a lot as in like every Friday hop to the bar and have a drink. But um, I would uh, I did remember um, probably having drinks like more than twice every, um, I don't know, month or two months or so. Um, now, I don't even remember when was the last time I had a drink, probably when I was uh Oh, yeah. Um, Probably when I was in Pittsburgh back in June. But then before that, I don't even remember when was the last time. Such dedication. So obviously, as you mentioned, this has health benefits way beyond the chess world. But but just out of curiosity, Megan, I mean, you've got a successful burgeoning career outside of chess. But do you have um, do you have firm goals for chess or is it just sort of your passion project? Oh, yeah. Um, Well, first and foremost, I definitely want to try to get to um, expert rating um, as soon as I can. Um, I originally set that as my goal um, last year, but uh, realized that like class A has its difficulties way more than I thought. Um, So uh, I guess like my new goal now is to try to crack um, 2000 um, by the end of uh, this year or even more as as a stretch goal. Um, before I, uh, or maybe even more as a stretch goal before um, I turn, uh, before I celebrate my birthday on September 12th. Okay. Yeah. Well, we might as well talk about it now, Megan. I mean, I don't know the whole story. I don't know if it feels, I mean, it probably feels like a slump to you, but you know, your ratings down over a hundred points from its peak. And I'm guessing, you know, 80% of listeners, myself certainly included in that can, can relate to that feeling. So uh, wh- how does it feel going, going through a slump like that? Um, at first it was fairly discouraging, but then I eventually, um, got used to it after, um, hearing what people have told me about, like, how difficult it is to climb from 1800 to 2000, um, as opposed to climbing from, like, say, 1300 to 1500. And, uh, so as a result of, like, hearing their stories about, like, how, um, how much, like, as much as you try to um, gain your knowledge or um, do more tactics or study more openings or add more openings to your repertoire, um, it, it, it there there comes to a point where there is a bit of a um, uh, there there's a bit of a um, plateau bump um, in the middle of the road because uh, it takes time for um, the brain, despite accumulating more knowledge, to eventually. Um, take in that knowledge and let it like sink in a um, smooth manner and um, become to a point where like it um, translates into um, over the board confidence. And um, I think also another thing that uh, can sometimes uh, be a struggle when it comes to um, gaining, uh, gaining rating um, in terms of like uh, what happens as far as over the board performance is uh, getting used to new habits too. So like sometimes like, um, I think that uh, the times where I would kind of plateau, um, I remembered, I think one of, one of the uh, one of the things that uh, as far as like um, chess focused stuff goes um, that really influenced me back then was um, either um, adding new um, chess books to my study routine or um, even changing my openings to. Um, I remember, I think uh, during 
my um, plateau when I was stuck in the 1500s for a while. And um, even right now in the past uh, couple of months, actually, like since the past, uh, well, not not the past year, but more like the past couple months, I had also been um, adding a bunch of um, new openings to my repertoire. And so um, that also has an influence, too, because uh, your mind is kind of trying to like think of a brand new way to approach approach the board in terms of like feeling comfortable in a new skin with regards to like a new flavor of positions that you would see on a typical basis on the board. Um, There's that there's that also combined with some um, personal life stuff uh, back in. Um, winter of last year, which I was eventually able to um, get through thanks to the help of some um, really good friends. Yeah, there's yeah. A, there's a lot to follow up on from from there. But I mean, one thing I'll, I'll say is just I, I, having looked at your rating graph, you were probably a little bit spoiled going in. I mean, <laughs> I mean, you mentioned a, a plateau in the 1500s, but I barely noticed it looking at your your rating graph. Um, I mean, you you basically had somewhat um, smooth smooth progress over those thousand points and of course uh people's plateaus are going to come at different levels obviously i agree that 18 you know 1800 to 2000 is harder than 1600 to 8 to 1800 and as you yeah i remembered i think i think i zoomed past like um 1600 to 1800 in like I don't even know how long it even took me um since the time when i first crossed 1600 to the time when i first hit um 1800 <laughs> yeah it's it's funny how like that works that much time. And even though it's probably been longer this time and you're you're farther probably than you'd hoped you would be from 2000, like when when the turn comes, it can come quickly. I mean, growth is it's like you have these periods of um, um, I'm drawing a blank on the word, but oh, consolidation. You have these periods of consolidation where you can even go down, but then you kind of have another jump. So I'm I'm sure that the, that this has not been your last jump, but that also ties into your last tournament. So as we talked last week, you were getting ready to head to Wisconsin for a tournament, and um, you briefly touched on this. But um, how did this one end up? Um, it didn't really uh, go so well for me, mainly because uh, I think uh, one of the games uh, really threw me uh, really threw me off for the rest of the tournaments. Like I, in that game, I was playing against some thirteen thirty two player, and I was starting off really well, um, playing in one of my favorite opening lines. And then all of a sudden, um, when things got exciting, when I was building a really strong attack on him. Um, I ended up having uh, one of these situations where, like, I had two choices of a knight to put on g5, ended up moving the wrong one there, and then later had another moment where um, I had, uh, uh, where I had, to, uh, again, two choices of a piece to capture on h7, um, and ended up, again, picking the wrong piece, one of those tricky situations as to why attacking chess is hard. Um, I ended up uh, having a little bit of a psychological downfall for the rest of the game and proceeded to make, like, at least a couple more blunders that eventually threw away the game, um, despite my opponent giving me multiple chances to um, come back with uh, winning moves. Um, I actually analyzed that game already and am actually about to um, go over, over it with Ryan later tonight as we talk. Um, but, uh, yeah, that ter- that game ended up... Um, Ruin, ruining my pairings for the rest of the tournament and I was and I ended up having to play only a 600 player in the subsequent round and I was just like eh, I've had enough chess for the weekend because I knew, knew that my game was um or was not like totally on point and so I ended up withdrawing and just deciding to use the time to just relax and recover from the tournament especially because um this Friday I'm gonna be um playing a uh playing a uh, uh, uh playing a nighttime match for um my DC chess league team and yeah, and for those listeners who are curious, yes, I do play on the DC Chess League team, even though I live in Chicago. Huh. I, uh, hope, I hope you don't travel back and forth. <laughs> well, um, I uh, well, I um, would uh, the the DC Chess League teams would only, matches would only happen like roughly about like once a month um, for this uh, current summer season. So it's not like you know. A weekly thing so it's not like i'm flying um cross country every single weekend or stuff like that but you are going there when you have like once a month um yeah but um wow. just whenever whenever i can make the matches it's not like i'm obligated to play all the matches i just go to um whichever matches i can and i like my team so um uh i am uh, i often try to do my best to uh, make it there megan i'm gonna throw down the gauntlet i think you may be the most dedicated class player 
in in the country. I need uh, anyone who thinks they can top you, uh, send me an email <laughs> because that, that's amazing dedication. Uh, that, so my hat's off to you. That's awesome. Um, and I mean, and that's on top of obviously 25 tournaments a year, a year, which is lower, as you mentioned from earlier. So good for you. Um, so, uh, Megan, as you know, we've got a few Patreon supporter questions to power through. So um, if you're up for it, I don't know what time your lesson is, but if you're up for it, what I would like to do is read you these three questions, and then we just want to power through like your opinions on a few different study improvement methods. Are, are you sure, good with definitely. that? Sure, definitely. Yeah, okay. of course. Cool. So on to the next question, and some of these are going to sort of blend together with stuff we've talked about, but I want to make sure you, you head on address uh, the, the people who are nice enough to send in questions. And I, and I know that, as I mentioned to you before, you're, you prove to be a popular guest. I know that the, the adult improver episodes are popular and people, people are definitely looking to pick the brains of other working professionals who've had success. So on that theme, here's a question from David Kofer. Thank you for the support, David. So David says, for a working adult with only a few hours of a available study each week, study time, what would be the best use of those few hours? What percentage for studying tactics, reviewing GM games, and for practice games, et cetera? So um, I would say for me personally, most of my study time is spent doing um, tactics, uh, either from chess.com tactics trainer or from sometimes from Chess Tempo's um, Tactics Trainer, and sometimes also from um, whatever tactics books I'm working on. Uh, right now, having already finished, uh, ha- having already recently finished uh, Bloke's mass- uh, Combinational Motifs book, um, I'm still deciding on like what my uh, next real serious uh, chess tactics or calculation um, problems book will be. Uh, but I've been um, looking through and debating uh, debating a couple right now. Um, but as far as like a uh, tactics trainer, that's basically my, um, da- uh, my day, my daily, um, battleground. Um, I would always do a couple of tactics, um, every morning when I get out of bed, um, during lunch at work, um, or during break time at work and, um, for a couple hours, um, every evening, um, after work, after work as well. And also, um, in bed before I fall asleep. So it's almost, it's almost as though sometimes I find myself just like living on chess.com for, um, quite a big chunk of the day, but, um, I don't regret it. I feel like, um, it's been helping me a lot. And, uh, I also do a lot of puzzle rush whenever I get the time. Oh, good for you. Are you able to keep the puzzle, excuse me, keep the puzzle rush habit under control? <laughs> Good question. Yeah, it's, um, the answer is sometimes yes, sometimes no. Sometimes I um, think. Uh, sometimes I say to myself, "Hey, I have uh, a plan to uh, look at certain positions or look at certain games or whatever," and I end up spending a whole afternoon or a whole evening on Puzzle Rush. Um, luckily for me, it has helped me um, in the long run improve my ability to spot. Um, tactical patterns fairly quickly and efficiently and um, just not too long ago I uh, hit my all-time record of 35. Awesome yeah uh-huh. and it might be um, as addictive as alcohol but definitely better for your health so. It's definitely better than alcohol <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> that's for sure. So yeah and I just want to echo your, the advice that you gave to David I mean it's you know it sounds um, boring to say you know do spend a large part of the time doing tactics but if if your primary objective is to get better at chess, that's really, I mean, especially I think, um, you know, below 1900 or something like that, that's the best bang for your buck. And especially if you have a coach, because uh, um, when you have a coach, they're able to help with the more positional things. And those things can be oh, actually. Yes, I agree. That's and, for sure. And they also help um, to during the lessons, whenever appropriate, uh, going through relevant Grandmaster games, if they um, either have a theme or a middle game idea that uh, that they think is worth me learning and absorbing the um, educational content from, or if they see games that are relevant to my opening repertoire, too. Yeah. Um, so, it, yeah, it's not uh, no points for originality from either of us. But yeah, just grind the tactics as hard as, hard as you can, David. Um, and sooner or later it'll pay off. Although it does, you know, it's hard when you're an adult, the, the tactics improvement often doesn't come as fast as you, you like. So, I I mean, I do want to give that caveat, but, but that's, uh, kind of indicative of chess improvement overall. So, you know, you just kind of have to accept that and just, uh, commit to the process. 
Uh, oh, yeah. And um, also, uh, not directly chess related, but I definitely think also um, having a certain amount of time to just uh, get exercise per day um, also helps in the long run with like keeping my um, general well-being healthy for the chess brain, too, because um, I, uh, I I walk to and from work. So that always helps. So how many how long a walk is it? Um, so, uh, at my current job, it's roughly about like 15 minutes each way. Um, which is, uh, which is pretty nice and pretty scenic because I live, um, in downtown Chicago. And are you like a headphones in your ears person? Or are you like clearing your head when you walk just out of curiosity? Oh, nah, I clear my head when I walk is, and also I feel like it's just way too crowded, um, downtown to be like, just walking around with, um, headphones in and not really paying attention to your surroundings. So, okay. Yeah. Well, I mean, cause you hear a lot of super GMs actually, they all talk about how they like to take walks and they're not talking about like, you know reading Twitter on their phone while they're listening to a podcast, something, oh, I've, been, yeah. something I've been known to do. Um, you know, <laughs> well, they're, they're um, like, I mean, it paid off in the long run because another, another thing also too, is that um, chess has also made me um, a lot healthier. I think ever since I uh, resumed my um, very serious chess studies back in um, December, 2015, when I would do more than just casual play, um, I believe I lost like uh, over um, 20 pounds ever since then. Good. Good for you. Yeah. Okay. Next up from Greg Natal. So Greg, uh, his, he's, um, I mean, I think he touches on this, but his questions have come up once or twice recently. He's, a uh, um, recent retiree in his early sixties, who's just super excited about chess, but basically brand new to it. Uh, so that's the context. Um, and Greg says, Hey, Megan, I admire your quest and your hard work improving your chess. Chess Chess.com has me rated at 900 and I want to improve. Uh, How much do you deal? How do you deal with the moments of defeat? So we talked about that a little, but I mean, it's an evergreen topic. And do you have any advice on how I might find a coach? And finally, which three or four books should a 900 player be studying? I need help with tactics and making blunders. Don't we all, Greg? (laughs) Um, Okay, so what do you what do you think, Megan? Um, so, uh, first of all, um, with regards to finding a coach, um, I think, um, first of all, definitely a good place to look is, um, well, uh, asking around your local chess community with like, uh, who's, um, who's available locally to coach. Um, and, uh, it's definitely also important that like when you ask, ask, um, others in your local chess community for coach advice that you, um, indicate, uh, what your rating strength is because like just because somebody can be a good coach for like a 1700 player doesn't mi- mean that they would be a good coach for an 800 player and so um i think first of all that's definitely um important to make sure that uh whatever coaches you end up choosing to um work with or consider working with would be um very uh productive for people working with people at your rating level um secondly i think it's also important with regards to um, picking and choosing coaches um, to get a sense of like how their structure is like, like, do they give you homework? Do they, um, uh, uh, do they um, assess you on um, certain areas of the game from time to time? Do they um, spend most of the lesson time doing um, calculation training or um, opening prep or um, practice games or um, game analysis and review, et cetera, and uh, get a sense of like how their uh, philosophies are like. And um, that, uh, that I think can um, really help you um, understand uh, what uh, their teaching methods are like too. And also um, I think another thing that some coaches um, often do, um, not everyone does, but I do know that some coaches, I believe including um, Ryan as well, um, do this thing where they offer a um, first time or uh, orientation type lesson or like a free trial type of lesson where it's kind of like a good setting to where the coach and student would get together for the first time and kind of like uh, go through like a um, get to know you kind of lesson. Um, so they assess your, uh, that's where the coach would like assess your strength level and what you want to get out of um, lessons and uh, determine like if uh, the coach student relationship would be a good fit. Um, and, uh, as far as like chess books that I think novice players are under 1000 rated players should study, I would say that the, um, top two things that I would recommend the most are Bobby Fisher teaches chess and, um, uh, Laszlo Polgar's, um, super huge, uh, chess book that contains like a whole bunch of puzzles with like mates in one, two, threes, fours, or fives. They're, um, 
pretty ideal for like warm up puzzles for like the more experienced players. But like for um, players who are like rated below a thousand, I think that they can be a good um, way for them to sharpen their um, ability to spot um, mating patterns and understand how pieces work together to um, checkmate the king. Yeah, and you get great bang for your buck with that Laszlo Polgar book. I definitely I echo the recommendation, and it's been been recommended um, a few times. And yeah, Greg, uh, just just to piggyback on what Megan said, the other thing, and I've mentioned before, I think maybe even in, in response to Greg, there's the LeeChess.com coaches page. There's the Chess.com coaches page. And the thing about the introductory lesson, um, I used to offer like half off on on my first lesson like as as you mentioned like coaches do that sort of thing um you can try people i mean coaches they're not going to be super offended if you hire them for one lesson and then you just decide it's not the best fit um so greg i wouldn't try to be too precious about who you try out especially at your level as megan alludes to it's more about a personal connection than yeah that i think is the most important thing and i think that it's definitely very important to find a coach who will um remain humble and remain um encouraging because like um i've also personally met many grandmasters who are who like while as much as like they can be very good and very knowledgeable at the game um have it being having the ability to the coach or encourage a um significantly lower rated player is a much different story from like um having the brains to play uh, to play the game at a 2500 level yeah very good yeah. point Okay, and one more question from supporter of the podcast, John Cromarty. John, thanks for the support. Um, he asks, what has been the most difficult part of improving as an adult after seven, several years away f- from playing the game as a kid? Hmm, that's a tough question. Um, but I would like to say that um, if I could pick one thing, um, I would definitely um, say that... Um, the most intimidating or the toughest thing is um, getting over the psychological intimidation of the presence of kids at chess tournaments. (laughs) And um, as funny as that sounds, I think that that can be a real struggle for a lot of adults because a lot of adults notice that like of all the chess players, like in general of all ages, the um, core demographic of chess players who improve the fastest in, um, a local or even a nationwide chess community. Most of them are younger scholastic players because of the fact that they have so much energy, they have young brains and they're fresh. And um, in in the summer, they, if they really want to, they can literally sit and sit, sit in front of a chess book and study chess all day um, when they don't have to go to school. Um, And so I think that like uh, the most difficult part is uh, just trying to like find uh, find the time and balance um, in the new uh, life atmosphere because of the fact that like um, as opposed to being a kid um, as an adult, you have to um, work every day. And so um, that's also uh, so the the main difference there is trying to like adjust to that sort of new life routine in terms of uh, having a job and also having like adult responsibilities like bills to pay um, things to manage in your own home, et cetera. And so, um, I mean, once you get used to, like, um, your uh, lifestyle group with, like, how you want to integrate um, chess studies with your typical, uh, with your day-to-day adult life, um, I think after that's, like, over with, then, like, eventually it all flows together. That's a great answer, though. It's definitely true and something we haven't touched on all that much on this podcast. I was... uh um, I think I've mentioned international master Alex Katz before. Um, I follow him on Twitter and he just came back from the world open and he wrote like he did one of these twit longer things where he basically writes an essay and <laughs> he wrote an essay about like things. He, and of course he's super strong, like 2,500 USCF, give or take um, uh, about how frustrating he's finding tournaments now, both because of the two games a day thing. But he also mentioned how he doesn't have as many peers playing as he used to. And of course, Megan, as a woman, um, you've got an added hurdle on top of, I mean, not a hurdle, not the, the fact that you're a woman is not a hurdle, but you've got less company. Um, so yeah, I mean, that's something that everyone has to grapple with as an adult, almost whatever level you are. I mean, you even hear grandmasters talk about it. But I mean, it's chess is a beautiful game that anyone from any age can appreciate. So I mean, I think you really just need to focus on on the process and focus on what what you're trying to get out of it. But it is a a, a good it's it's a really good answer. I think it's a really good point that we haven't highlighted that much here. Yeah, and like um also another another interesting thing that um I think also uh is interesting about like being an active chess player as an adult is that 
personally, I feel like it has also really opened up my social circles and increased my um, ability to make friends with others um, in terms of like uh, in, in terms of like um, the general demographic of people that um, I would make friends with. Because like in a typical situation, you know how like most um, most people, especially I would say like younger adults who are just fresh out of school because they're so used to doing so when they're young, they would often like mingle with um, just the people who are like um, the same age as them. But like um, as far as like the adult chess community, there's I mean, mo- I would say that like um, there's a very varied amount of um, people of different age groups ranging from like younger, um, just fresh out of college, working professionals to um, middle uh, middle age adults who are parents or and have um, spouses or children. And um, finally, you have the older folks who are retired and just um, spend their time um, uh, uh, enjoying chess as a retirement hobby. And so, um, I mean, the nice thing is that like you meet all these people of um, varied um, social backgrounds and um, general um, personality backgrounds. And um, it really is interesting to like see, um, you know, um, different sorts, uh, different sorts of people in the chess community, too. Yeah, that's a good point. I mean, it's yeah, it cuts both ways. I mean, you may not have that many of your exact peers, but it's it's good to meet people from different backgrounds. Um, and different ages, for sure, too. Yeah, yeah exactly. I, I have um, very close friends, both um, uh, who are like older adults who are like older than age 50 and even um, even little kids who are as young as um, 10 years old, too. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, it's fun to see the the kids, like the the ten year olds and the teenagers, getting into it, and also trying to sort of find themselves at the same time. Um, okay, so Megan, uh, we we'll try to speed up here because we've still got a bunch of topics, and and we already wasted your time last week. So, um, what are your favorite chess books, Megan? Um, I would say uh, definitely combinational motifs um, by Bloke, um, and uh, along with that, I'd also like to um, highly recommend to people Active Pieces by Jay Bonin. It offers um, a great um, a great collection of games from um, the Iron Man of Chess himself. And um, actually, he is one of my inspirations in terms of having um, superpower endurance for playing a lot of tournaments per year because um, I think Jay Bonin is the one American chess player who has played more tournaments than anybody else in the country oh, as far sure. as the quantity. <laughs> yeah, and so that's why he is known as the Iron Man of Chess. And, uh, well, looking at his games always uh, inspires me that in chess games it's important to keep those pieces active and um plus the puzzles that he has in his uh tactics section of the book um are very fun to look at um i also would definitely give a shout out to um jacob agard's um attacking manual um volumes one and two um and uh i would also highly recommend um uh, imagination in chess too, um, which is a new book that I'm looking into for um, doing some more tactics puzzles per Ryan's suggestion. And do you remember the author imagination in chess? I think that's the one that Agard himself recommended when I interviewed him um, by a Georgian author. Um, um, I do not remember the author's name off the top of my head. I think it's, um, yeah. Okay. Uh, Got it. Pata yeah, Gaprandishvili. Um, yeah, and recommended by Eric Rosen and Jakob Agard and oh, Megan I, Chen. I, I think I think his last name starts with a G. It's like Gaprin Gaprandishvili yep. or something. Yeah, you got it. Gaprandishvili. Yeah. Um, okay. Yeah. So that one's out of print, but you can find it. Uh, so okay. So Megan, next up, and some of these we've we've touched on already. Um, so we can go faster on those, but basically we always kind of uh, on these adult improver interviews, I like to just sort of give a little sample of how important you think various chess improvement um, approaches are. So on a scale, I want you to rate basically each of these potential study or life activities on a scale of one to 10 in terms of how much they help your chess. So on a scale of one to 10, how important is it to have a personal coach? Um, I would definitely say 10 because um, the one-to-one interaction is like truly valuable and very important because uh, having a coach um, specifically tailored to your individual needs of getting better as a chess player is definitely a um, perfect way to go. Okay. And we've talked about this as well, but analyzing games, your own games. Yes, that uh, that is super valuable. I'd also say that, that that's definitely worth a 10 out of 10. Uh, online blitz. 
Hmm. That can be a little bit uh, of a um, debatable topic because, like, um, some people look at blitz as, like, um, a good way to drill openings and stuff or to um, improve your chest intuition, while others um, see it as, like, um, addicting and sometimes also can be um, introducing bad habits such as playing too fast. I'm kind of, like, in the middle of uh, of the scale, so I would probably put that um, – as, like, um, a 5 out of 10, because as much as, like, I tend to get stressed out for, like, faster time controls, I think that, like, um, it still does have its benefits, um, especially when it comes to just drilling um, openings and opening lines and, like, also uh, just getting used to uh, preparing for possible offbeat responses that people may um, play to deviate from, like, your main prepared lines of an opening. That's a good point. And also, I guess, and, and also, um, another key benefit for Blitz is um, just trying to get more used to what it's like to play when you're short on time on the clock. Yeah, which that's will eventually one. happen once you um, play a game for um, a certain number of moves. You're good, Megan. Especially that's exactly what I was what I was going to follow up on. Yeah, it's good for practicing being in time trouble. And do you play? Uh, I'm guessing I know the answer to this, but do you play all time controls? Do you play classical and uh, action as well? Um. I used to play. I used to play um, dual rated stuff uh, yeah. when I was like below fifteen hundred. I would say um, right now I mostly focus on classical because I don't have the energy to be able to play um, one tournament every weekend or two tournaments every weekend as much as I used to um, when I was like rated below fifteen hundred. So um, I am more selective with my tournaments these days and mostly only limit to like classical time controls. So by classical, I mean like. Usually those tournaments that um, would span out over five games over three days or two days and would be like game 90 or slower. Okay. And for listeners wondering, dual rated usually means like 25 or 30 minutes per side, um, often with a delay. Uh, Sometimes and the- like game 40 or game 45 with a five second delay or even um, I think all the way up to like game 60 with a five second delay or game 65 with no delay, which... No delay things are not really a thing anymore, I don't think. Yeah, okay. And then just so anyone wondering knows, they call it dual rated because you get like a separate quick rating that it also counts toward here in the United States. Um, Okay, next up, Megan, uh, watching elite tournaments. Hmm. I would say um, I would rate that that as about um, a seven. I think that they're useful um, for sure because uh, you get inspired by ideas of strong players. Um, But personally, I haven't really done um, too much of it because uh, most of the time um, I'm mostly only inspired to watch games whenever they happen live. And I often don't do so when um, the games are happening during my working hours. Yeah, I just can't. I I mean, the announcers these days are so incredible, too. I wish I had more time, but I just can't sit there and and watch a game for for several hours. I can check it on my phone, but yeah. Yeah, I mean, I can. I, I feel you. I can do the same, but like, it's not the same when like you know you have things to do during your day and you can't exactly like fully listen to the commentator while you're trying to like get work done. Right. And so it's just like, well, why am I really listening to this? Am I really getting anything out of it when I actually have like stuff to do at work? Yeah, and you, it's like you turn it on just for a couple minutes, hoping to catch something, and they're like in the middle of some variation. You don't even know what variation it is. So, um, or they're in the middle of some great story, which can be fun, but uh, you know, it's right up my alley, but not not really going to help your chest necessarily. Mm-hmm. Right. Um, okay. Next up, studying openings. Um. So uh, back when I was like say below sixteen hundred, I would probably rate that as like only a five. And the reason for that is because, um, well, really at that level, you only need to, like, study openings to the point where, like, you can get um, reasonably comfortable middle game um, positions and plans to work off of. And uh, the fact that, like, uh, and there's also the fact that um, people that low rated are not going to know, like, um, 10 to 15 to 20 or even more moves of um, uh, of mainstream GM um, computer analyze theory and so um i think the key thing there is to just like understand positions uh, positions and basic fundamentals and get out of the opening with like um uh, a decent middle game to um be able to play um at my current level i would probably raise the rating of that to somewhere about like hmm, i don't know seven um or so i wouldn't say nine or ten nine or ten would probably be best reserved for like two thousand plus players um Mostly because, like, um, 
players rated below 2,000 still have ways to work um, on their calculation abilities, such to the point where, like, yeah, even if you memorize, like, 10 or 15 or even 20 moves of opening theory, great. But, like, um, things start changing course, like, in the middle or, middle or end game when, like, eventually you're going to run into a position that, like, isn't really part of your prep and you have to figure out, like, how to work from there. And um, I think that's where um, you got to um, try to start uh, thinking about, like, um, general principles about, like, how to evaluate middle and end game positions and uh, formulate plans from there and think about um, things like um, weaknesses or... Um, positional uh, principles too. Yeah. And I've mentioned this many times, but I just want to quickly reiterate, you you really want to focus on when, when you have a given result in a given game, you want to focus on what the, what contributed most to that. And my argument generally is that, as you say, below the 2000 level, and I think maybe even a little bit higher, it's usually not going to be just like, Oh, they, you know, they knew the opening one moved deeper than me and they just crushed me. Usually it's going to be like you were a little better or you were a little worse out of the opening, but then someone made a bigger mistake somewhere down the line. Um, so we want to just keep working to limit those mistakes and uh, just try to understand the the fundamentals of openings. My two cents. <laughs> All right. Uh, and you mentioned this one before, Megan, but how important do you think exercise is? Um, I'm going to say uh, I'm going to rate that as an eight out of 10 um, because it is important, but um, I still feel like, um, still um drilling your calculation skills is like much more important like relative to that but i still think that like how uh, that on um, physical exercise is important in terms of like uh just trying to overall stay healthy so that you can think better sounds reasonable yeah and you can't give everything a 10 so <laughs> yeah for sure <laughs> there's that too and what about uh studying end games hmm. i'm gonna say um as much as people often undervalue them um, in terms of like general uh, chess study habits, including myself, I'm guilty of that sometimes. I'm going to say um, I would rate that about an eight because um, I think, I mean, it's important definitely for sure to uh, understand how to execute good endgame technique when you have a um, slightly better winning position or um, grind out something, grind out a way to obtain an edge if you have in have an equal position. Um, but at the same time, it's not like, I mean, as much as like there are many different, uh, theoretical end game positions out there, um, it would probably take like a real long while to like, um, remember all of them or maybe not necessarily remember, but like actually recognize them and apply, um, uh, uh, apply your knowledge of them to like get, um, uh, get them on the board whenever you're trying to play for a win or a draw. Um, but overall, I think that like, as far as like end game importance goes, I think that like, it's more, probably more important than openings. But, um, I think that like, uh, I would rate middle games knowledge and like calculation ability, um, and the ability to spot like, um, moves like, um, way deeper ahead, but that kind of also, um, blends in with end games too, because like, um, in many end game positions, you definitely have to um, calculate a uh, couple moves ahead too. Most especially in like um, rook pawn endings and king and pawn endings. King and pawn endings for sure, because like there's so little room for error. Um, so I would give that like, yeah, an eight. Okay. Yeah, I might come in even a little bit higher, but generally I agree with, with what you said. I mean, I, I would say if you're below 2000 and you're spending more time studying openings than end games, you might want to think about flipping that. And it can be. It can, as you mentioned, seem less accessible, but you know there there are resources. I mean, first of all, there's the the what should, this is going to feed into our next question. But you can just enjoy the games of the, the end game legends like Karpov and Carlson and Capablanca and people like that. But there's also like a hundred end games you must know on Chessable um, at a slightly lower level. There's Silman's end game course. Oh yeah, I've um, used uh, uh, I've studied um, Silman's end game manual um, before, and I think that it's definitely a valuable resource to review different kinds of um, theoretical end game positions as well as um, techniques for converting different kinds of end games. And um, the exercises at the end of each chapter are definitely definitely worth a shot. And um, it's a book that's certainly um, also worth um, going over more than once. Um, many people who have read it told me that uh, because of how much knowledge Silman shares in that book, um, in order to like really have the concepts 
totally drilled in your head, I think it's definitely worth going over that book, like more than just a single time. Yeah. And there's also the drills on chess.com are good. The end game drills. Um, and, and, uh, and one last thing on the end game theme. I mean, it may seem like, okay, how often do you have the Lucina position, but all of this stuff kind of builds on each other. So even if, I mean, first of all, the Lucina does come up, but, but even if, it feels unrelated. It it all sort of uh, feeds backward into your overall chest level and helps you with transitions. So uh, strong, strong plug for end games. Um, next up. And as I mentioned, this is somewhat related since I was just mentioning studying end game wizards. Uh, how important is it to study grandmaster games, Megan? Um, I am going to also rate that as like fairly highly important. So I'm going to give that uh, an eight out of 10. Um, and it's mainly because of the fact that, um, Grandmaster games often um, teach us uh, what kinds of middle game plans uh, come out of uh, typical positions arising from certain openings. And um, it's also very good to like keep up to date with like what strong players have been um, playing as far as like playing styles or um, openings go too. Yeah, I agree. Um, and last but not least online videos. Hmm. Um, Personally, I don't use them a lot, but um, I would say that uh, as far as like um, online videos go, I would rate that as like roughly a six out of 10 because um, it kind of varies and it can be a little um, little um, different from time to time, depending on like how the vi- videos are structured. Like if they um, if they have um, interactive components like um certain exercises, uh, such as, for example, in um, Nazi Pykitsi's um, Endgame Renaissance video, um, there are certain sec- segments of her video lectures that say, pause the video and solve this problem or position. Um, I think those interactive type ones are um, much more um, helpful because then, like, uh, they give you the chance to really try to take the time to absorb um, what you've listened to in the prior minutes um, while um, applying the skills that you learned to um Figure out a uh, uh, figure out a position where you try to practically apply um, the concepts that you picked up. Um, there are also other videos that, while they're fun, they're fun to watch. Like, for example, watching streamers um, play um, their um, online blitz or bullet or rapid games. Um, I think that like uh, the videos can kind of vary in terms of um, overall educational value with like improving your game, um, and so. Yeah, averaging it all out, I would rate that as roughly around like a six out of ten. Okay, yeah, I would put it on the lower end for sure. And where can where can listeners find that uh, that Nazi Pikitsi video you referenced? Do you remember offhand? Um, yeah, um, I think uh, you can find that on iChess.net. Oh, uh, okay. Yeah. yeah, a lot of good videos there. Or if you just Google search Nazi Pai Kidsy and Game Renaissance, I think um, yeah, you can find it somewhere uh, oh, from that. Okay, too. cool. Um, well, Megan, that is the end of the list. And I think it's basically all of the major topics. So you mentioned before your next goal is 2000, um, a rating of 2000 USCF. Do you have like, um, do you think more big picture? Like, do you dream of playing in the U S women's championship or like, uh, quitting your job or anything like that? Or is it more just like, you know, enjoy it for what it is and don't, don't think too far ahead sort of thing. Well, I would say um, there's a mix of both, like, enjoy the moment while I have it um, to um, play, uh, you know, as many tournaments as I do right now. Um, But I definitely think that, like, um, eventually um, getting seated into the U.S. Women's Championship is um, not a goal to dodge. Um, I think it's definitely um, something that uh, I want to uh, for sure work at. I've had, like, um, I think... Three uh, three major fans, including my biggest one, tell me that they really want to see me make it to the U.S. Women's Championship. And so because I don't want to disappoint them, especially the number one fan, you know, who uh, uh, if you're li- listening to this, you know who you are. Um, yeah, it's um, my number one, number one, number one long term goal for sure. If they're number <laughs> if they're your number one fan, they better be listening to this. Yes, definitely. but but yeah, I mean, I think uh, based on the 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 improvement you've shown already um i would say it's a a lofty but a but achievable goal just like you know uh, obviously not knowing you personally um but 
but seeing what you've achieved, I mean, you probably need to get to at least like in the neighborhood of 2300 USCF. Is that what you think? Yeah, I would think so. Um, especially because of like how much stronger the younger, littler girls are getting these days. So I would yeah. say like at least 2300 USCF. Yeah. Well, yeah. I think, I think, you know, it'll be interesting. I mean, it would be, it would be amazing if you did it. And um, I mean, the components are there. I mean, you're, you're, as I've mentioned, you. I mean, it's it's really amazing the amount of work you're putting in, and it's good that you do have the perspective. Like, do it while you can. Speaking as a you know a married person with kids, um, yeah, you gotta gotta put the time in now, and um, and yeah, I mean, to hang in there. I know that that you're in a minor slump, but if you look at the big picture, you're doing amazing, Megan. Yeah, thank you. Um, okay, well, Megan, if anyone wants to track your journey, is there a way they can do that? Uh, yeah, I play on both um, chess.com and um, Lee Chess. Um, on Lee Chess, my handle is uh, Goss1181, um, where Goss is uh, the name of that mathematician, Car- uh, Carl Friedrich um, Goss, G-A-U-S-S. Um, and on chess.com, my um, handle is E4Wins1-0, because, yeah, I've always grown up playing E4 openings, and I still enjoy them. Um, uh-huh. and <laughs> you yeah. just gave your um, opponents I a also, tip. Um, am working with a an all star super powerful um um uh, super powerful chess team on a uh, club on chess.com called Play Like the Masters. So, viewer uh, listeners, if you um are looking for good clubs to join on chess.com, please join Play Like the Masters. Okay, awesome. I'll link to all that stuff in the notes. And listeners, I want to apologize again for what I suspect are minor audio issues on the recording. I haven't listened, but I suspect it's doing this. It did this echo thing again. So if you're still with us, thanks for hanging in there. Uh, Hopefully it'll be resolved by next week's episode. Um, And I believe that is it. Um, So Megan, thanks again. Thanks to everyone who helps make Perpetual Chess possible. Of course, that includes my producer, Matthew Passy, and Geert Vandervelt. Thanks for supplying the theme music gear. I also want to thank everyone who helps spread the word about the show, whether it be by writing a positive review on Apple Podcasts or another platform, by telling a friend, by stopping a stranger on the street, social media, Facebook, Twitter, Instagram. Praising Perpetual Chess on all those things is helpful as well. But of course, most of all, I want to thank the people who help support the show financially. Without you guys, Perpetual Chess would not be possible. I want to give extra special thanks to the following people and entities. Chessable.com, Quality Chess Books, the Capital City Chess Club, the Apprentice Twitch Channel, Andrew Bach, Austin Clough, Benjamin Handelman, Kathy Carr, Chad Oliver, Dan O'Hanlon, I am Dimitri Schneider, Faraz Sawaf, Greg Shahadi, Guven Manet, Jens Green, John Jernigan, John Cromarty, Kelly Palmer, Lone Pine Chess, the Law Offices of Stuart Katz, the Seattle Chess Club, Sidney Andrews, Thomas Tachenko, and Todd Bryant. I also would like to give thanks to my Patreon and PayPal Perpetual Partners. They include, here comes the list, Andrew Waffler, Ace Viega, Adam Ralph of ChessEngland.com, Adrian Gutierrez, Alex Pejas, FM Andre Terakov, Benjamin Handelman, Bill Moran, Brad and Andy Rosen, Brett Howard Lynn, Brett Zeldo, Brian Mullis, Chad Hilton, Chris Balcom, Chris Flanagan, Chris Wainscott, Christopher Baumgartner, Christopher Shabri, Christopher Wood, I am Christoph Selecki, a.k.a. Chess Explained, Coach Jay's Chess Academy, David Kofer, Daniel Gell, Daniel Ginsburg, Dan Lucas of uschess.org, Daniel Naylor, Dave Saylor, David Cramley of Chessable.com, Dwayne Edmonds, Ethan Smith, I am Alec Donnie Ariel, Fox Valley Chess Club of Aurora, Illinois, Frank Tortoris, MD, Gary Andrews, Gary Lewis, Geert Vandervelt, Gerard Barto, Giovanni Russo, Greg Natal, Han Schut, Harish Srinivasan, James Banastia, Jason Willem, Jeff Anderson, Jeffrey Martello, J.J. Stranod, John Fernandez, John Fontaine, John Hartman, Justin Gardner, Jen Shahadi, Jerry Wells, John Thompson, GM Josh Friedel, Kare Christensen, WGM Katerina Nemsova, Kelly Palmer, I am Kostya Kovutsky, Krishna Gapalakrishnan, Laura Belyavsky, Lucio Casada Silva, Martin Knudsen, Matthew Passi, Matthew Tedesco of SeattleChessMeetup.org, Miguel Araspide, my main man, Moonmaster9000, Mr. Mike Shahadi, Nate Salon, Neil Bruce, GM Pascal Charbonneau, Passy Passanen, Paul Bain, Paul Clarkson, Paul Sweeney, 
Paulo Santana, Peter Lux, Peter Murrayfield, Randy Temple, Ricky Grijalva, Robert Steiner, Ryan Berg, Scott Doherty, Scott McKinnon, Steiner Lima, WGM Tati of Abrahamian, Thomas Stanix, Tim Brennan of TacticsTime.com, Tim Seymour, Timothy Ha, Tomas Komanich, Tony Rotella, Tyron Price, Victor Vrancouz, William Brock, William Peterson, FM Zhao Chang of Chess1000.com, and last but not least, Zhivko Storyanov. Thanks, everyone, and I will catch you all next week. Mm-hmm.